bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Holland Blurview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. We would also like to thank Prolacta Bioscience for supporting our webinar program. Prolacta is a life sciences company dedicated to improving quality of life by advancing the science of human milk and providing specialty formulations made exclusively from human milk for the nutritional needs of premature infants in the NICU. Prolacta has been a supporter of the CAFC conference for the last couple of years and we look forward to welcoming them and their colleagues back to the 2015 CAFC annual conference in Quebec City, where they'll be hosting a lunch session on the importance of human milk for premature infants in the NICU. All right, hello everyone and welcome uh, to today, today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. Today's webinar is titled Physical Disabilities and Obesity in Children, Clinical Dilemmas and Research Priorities. And today's topic is one of many that has come to us from CAFC's network of members that are interested in uh, children issues uh, uh, focused on children with disabilities and the, del and the delivery of uh, rehabilitation services. And that network is known as CINSER, the Canadian Network of Child and Youth Rehab. And joining me today is my co-host, uh, I always like to have her on these rehab-focused topics, is uh, uh, the chair of uh, CINSER's Research and KT Committee, Dr. Gail Andrew, from the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton. So uh, welcome and thanks for joining me, Gail. But before we uh, get started, uh, we've just got our usual things to get out of the way. Uh, as always, we take your questions at various times throughout the webinar. So I encourage you to type your questions into the question box as you think of them so that we, don't, so that we have the questions ready when it's time to present them to our panel. Don't feel you need to wait until we ask for questions. Just get them to us so we have them ready. Uh, you are free to come and go uh, out of the session. This does not interrupt the session, and we do record the entire webinar, so you can always go back to the recording and catch up on any parts that you might have missed. The recording and any other resources uh, and documents provided to us by our presenters will be posted on the Knowledge Exchange Network. It usually takes us a couple of days to get that information up, and you'll receive an automated message from the system with a direct link to the page, although you can always use the search function on the CAN to find that information as well. The CAN does also provide the opportunity for comments for registered users at the bottom of each page, and we encourage you to continue the discussion following this presentation by posting comments and links and other information that you think might be of interest to the folks that have joined us here today. All right, so now that we've got that out of the way, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today. Uh, we have two colleagues from the uh, Holland Blurview uh, Kids Rehabilitation Hospital and the Research Institute at uh, the Blurview Research Institute. Uh, we have Dr. Amy McPherson, who's a scientist at the Blurview Research uh, Institute uh, and, and the Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, where she leads the Profile Lab, uh, aiming to promote fitness and healthy lifestyles for everyone. She's also an assistant professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health and Institute of Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Toronto. And Dr. McPherson's uh, program of research focuses upon health promotion and wellness for children with physical disabilities with an emphasis on weight-related topics. And uh, Julia Lyons uh, is a, an ambulatory care nurse on the spina bifida and spinal cord team at the Holland Blurview Kids uh, Rehabilitation Hospital. Uh, and she also, uh, also has an appointment at the Bloorview uh, Research Institute as a clinical team investigator, where her work addresses timely research questions around promotion of the health and well-being of children with disabilities and long-term conditions. So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. McPherson and uh, Julia. Okay. So um, just a quick disclosure of the support we've received for the work we're going to talk about today, our own work. Um, and that's where we have... Uh, support from CIHR, Holland Bloorview, Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus Association of Canada. And you'll see we talk a lot about Spina Bifida and we'll say why that's important. Um, so just to quickly recap on the learning objectives that were advertised previously. So we know obesity is a, you know, it's a, a substantial issue with all kids. So today we're going to talk about how, what are these specific issues when we're looking at kids with um, physical disabilities. 
Um, we're also going to look at kind of some of our clinical practice and our research where our inclusion of kids with disabilities can be improved. Um, and also to kind of identify some of the areas um, of research priorities that we need to um, attend to. And as I said, I'm very happy to, uh, if you have any questions along the way, please just, um, just type them in uh, and we'll pause as we go through as well. So just first of all, just so we know um, who who's on the line and listening, uh, I think they have set, just set up uh, as multiple choice questions. So if you could just quickly tell us what your main role is. Yep, so just go up and uh, click on the screen and make your choice and we'll uh, tell you the results and flip them back. And if you are someone out there who is choosing the other category, feel free to type uh, what that other is in the question box and it'll give us a sense of, uh, a little bit better sense of who's out there. So some of the others that are out there are dietitians, uh, child life specialists, etc. So uh, for the results, we got most of the people are in that other category. Um, we've got an exercise therapist from Stomp at SickKids, uh, more child life specialists. Uh, but 39% identify themselves as clinicians, 4% uh, as researchers, 4% as clinical managers, and 4% as uh, trainees. Oh, okay, great. So a great broad crowd. Sorry, my screen keeps flashing to, is it still, can you still see my screen? Yeah, we can, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive right in then. So we know that the prevalence of obesity in, in Canadian children generally is, um, you know, quite high. So it's around 26 to 30 uh, percent of of children aged 2 to 17. But um, what is really interesting is that the prevalence of obesity among children and adolescents with disabilities uh, is actually substantially higher in some in some cases. So we can see, uh, this is U.S. data, um, so we can, we can see um, that uh, the, the green bars are no disability and the blue bars uh, are those with a disability. Um, and we can see there by gender, so physical limitations, physical disabilities, and learning disabilities. But today we're going to focus mostly on physical disabilities whilst recognizing that many kids with physical disabilities also have some form of developmental uh, issues or intellectual disability as well, but we're primarily looking at kids with physical disabilities. And you can see from the NHANES data, which is the US data, that um, there is a marked um, uh, difference, significantly uh, statistical significant difference between the kids with and without disabilities, um, around female and, and all uh, kids as well. So. Uh, in the literature, it describes uh, kids with disabilities as having a two to three times higher prevalence of obesity, although we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So um, again, just looking at the CDC um, statistics that they've um, released, and the, the website's on the bottom, um, we can see that um, there, again, is um, a very significant, looking at all kids with disabilities, there's a significant difference there. Uh, in, in the percentage of those who are uh, overweight or obese. Um, so, and I think probably most people who are on the line are, are have decided to do so because um, they realize, you know, they've encountered some issues with that or that they're aware um, of uh, that there is a risk disparity. So um, a series of work in sort of late 1990s and 2000 has um, shown that children with disabilities tend to eat less fresh produce, more high fat and fast food, uh, as well as more uh, chocolate, higher chocolate consumption than typically developing um, peers. They're also less likely to engage in physical activity uh, and more likely to engage in sedentary activities. Uh, so that was uh, in Canada and in, in Australia, they, they find that. So higher sedentary act behaviors, um, consumption of fast food, consumption of chocolates, uh, less fresh food. So we can see this sort of health promotion profile is actually quite different from kids with, uh, who are typically developing. So, we, so it raises some flags for us about different areas that we could potentially uh, sort of explore a bit more and might explain the higher obesity rates. So the, the, the reason it's so important is so the impact of obesity we know on all kids uh, can be substantial. 
Um, and we, we know there are cardiometabolic uh, implications of uh, childhood obesity. Uh, our concern is that a lot of obese children, uh, or children with obesity, sorry, um, turn into adults or grow into adulthood, we also living with, disability, with uh, obesity. So, um, you know, we, we are concerned um, with, with children anyway. With kids with disabilities, uh, it also is this unfortunate sort of vicious cycle where a disability puts them at increased risk of obesity, which so it, may, it might exacerbate their already what conditions they have, as well as introduce new conditions such as uh, extreme muscle loss, um, breakdown, skin ulcers, um, additional pain, uh, additional mo mobility limitations. Uh, as well as the psychosocial impact around isolation. We know our kids with disabilities are often isolated and socially excluded. Um, and we also know that kids who have obesity are also socially excluded. So again, you've got that sort of two-prong um, effect happening. And then all of this obviously has a um, huge import, uh, impact on the health of the child, both physically and mentally. But it also can um, increase the impact on the primary caregivers, um, parents and caregivers at home, as well as public health kind of care services, and then with the long-term kind of implications around cardiometabolic um, issues as well. So I thought I'd go through the kind of different risk factors. Um, when um, I tell people what I do, they often say, oh, well, it's because they can't kind of get, you know, be physically active. Uh, and actually, it's, can, there are quite a lot more risk factors than just that. Certainly, physical risk factors and mobility impairments do have, uh, you know, a, an impact. The fact of being able to um, ambulate and be physically active, especially sort of to um, moderate to vigorous activity, can be problematic sometimes or challenging. There may be complications from the condition they have, the disability they have. Um, for example, um, incontinence, which might stop them um, wanting to be physically active. Uh, they may already have pain syndromes, again, that might um, put them off. Uh, I've got a sort of fatigue. Uh, and then often our kids with, phys with uh, physical disabilities, if they can't be physically active, they are generally not particularly, um, they're physically fit. Balance and coordination may be included. And so that can be a real deterrent to trying to take part in physical activity if you know already that it's going to be challenging. In terms of physiological risk factors, I mean, some uh, disabilities do come with a predisposition to overeat, such as sort of Prada Willy. Um, they are sort of not so common, but what it might be is that the medications that our kids are on often, um, for example, we talk about descent muscular dystrophy when they go on um, steroids combined with um, a reduced physical activity, that can be um, a great risk factor for overweight and obesity. Um, metabolic irregularities have been suggested to play a role in um, increased body weight in um, some children with disabilities, um, may have a, rest, a lower resting energy expenditure, and so it can make that really challenging to achieve or maintain a healthy body weight. Um, so in spina bifida, again, it could have um, a high level of paralysis, and so anything be below the, that lesion um, will, often has a reduced requirement for caloric intake. But actually, det determining what that is is very, very challenging. Um, also, I think so, so, so structural impairments. So there are some forms of brown, brain malformations around Kyrie 2 um, that are common in spina bifida, certainly. But um, have um, there are other conditions. So that can actually affect uh, people's taste and texture. Uh, can ha cause problems with swallowing and gagging. So that can be really limiting around food intake. So the kids may have very specific tastes or textures that they can tolerate. But that is often um, bland food, um, white bread, chicken fingers, um, sort of foods that are very easy to eat. Um, so that can greatly affect their food preferences. And, and also, it can have some problems with breathing, which again, combined with uh, mobility impairments, then can result in sedentary lifestyles, and, and then that reduce physical fitness. So again, you can sort of see how these all play into each other um, as a comprehensive picture of the kind of risks and explaining why kids with physical disabilities may have higher prevalence of overweight and obesity. 
So environmental risk factors, um, we hear, again, the social model of, of disability is that the environment disables people with uh, impairments, and that's often seen in the environmental risk factors. So we always hear the lack of facilities and special equipment required for people with physical disabilities to be physically active. Uh, we ha we're very lucky in Ontario to have a, a couple of those now, and the Ability Centre in Whitby is a great example, but they're very few and far between. And even if the facilities or the equipment is there, often there's a real lack of um, trained sports and fitness staff, a lack of confidence, a lack of knowledge about how to work with someone who has a physical uh, disability. And of course, all of this costs money. And we know that um, families with a child with a disability ha do generally have a lower income and have economic pressures on them, which you make, may make access very challenging. So there's kind of a whole um, confluence of uh, issues going on there with our environmental risk factors, as well as every day moving around, curb cuts, being active. Um, being able to kind of take part in, in, in daily physical activities, so the very limited. And then in sort of there are also those psychosocial risk factors. So from children, I've just given one example, there are others, but that idea of low self-efficacy, the lack of confidence that they can be physically active, um, that um, they can have a healthy diet, um, we have the lovely Timbits there, or sorry, the, the, not shouldn't say where they come from, the uh, sweet snack there that um, we, we see, uh, you know, in, and a lot of hospitals have the um, fast food things, and often when kids come out of long and maybe painful appointments, they go downstairs and they have, you know, sort of a, a sugary snack to kind of make up for it. Um, totally understandable, and often a lack of other options. So we can see how kind of time and energy outside what can be very long medical appointments, you know, is going to impact upon the time and energy left for parents to be able to kind of um, to to look at food, um, at meals, meal planning, uh, and so on. Um, they may have a lack of understanding regarding the child's capabilities. We know with physical activity, certainly um, perceptions of child competence and, and family um, parent competence often do not um, align, um, and often children are capable of more or feel they are, and so we can work with that. Um, and then the food, so just what I was talking about, you know, um, upset child, child who's been in pain, there's a, a food pacification. We see that in typically developing kids all the time, so it's not surprising. It's very understandable, but it, that, that plays um, a part. And then the kind of differing priorities of saying, you know, parents trying to get through the day, trying to deal with other siblings as well as um, children, um, and really kind of the different impacts and the different burdens that are, are on parents that we have to recognize and understand. So um, I mentioned spina bifida, and as an example of how those things can all come together, those risk factors. So uh, many of our kids with spina bifida ha do have mobility restrictions. Um, they do often have the altered eating practices um, due to perhaps a Kyrie 2 malformation um, and continence as well. So um, we'll talk in a bit, but a lot of kids with uh, spina bifida do have continence issues. And so maybe eating or designing their diet around trying to reduce accidents um, or having to go to the washroom a lot during school uh, rather than thinking about have I got all four food groups and uh, you know how am I designing my my meals for optimum kind of Canada food guide <coughs> um, kind of thing. So um, that does have an impact. Uh, the limited access to activity settings. Um, there may be some cognitive impairment all the time, but then that may play a part. And we have seen in research that kids with spina bifida do have greater sedentary behaviors, lower fitness obesity and uh, cardiovascular um, risk. So they are by no means the only population at, at risk. Other vulnerable populations in the literature are around um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, who often, as I mentioned, can gain considerable weight um, at a certain point when they have a combination of the medication and the steroids and the reduced um, energy expenditure. 
And actually, some research has shown that the prevalence of obesity in boys with uh, Duchenne muscle dystrophy is up to around 73% by 13 years um, of age. So a, you know, a significant issue there. Cerebral palsy, there has been some work um, around that, um, as well as uh, uh, James Wimmer has done a lot of work around developmental disabilities and autism. So, I mean, there, there are many populations within our disability sphere that are um, at risk. So we were interested to find out from the people on the line, um, which of your client populations that you work with and see do you think um, these weight-related issues are particularly relevant for any kind of high-risk groups that would, be in, that would be useful to us? So if you want to vote, that would be helpful. Over to you, Doug. Yeah, so once again, just go up and click on the screen to make your choice. Which of the client populations you, you see do you think weight-related issues are most relevant for? And once again, if you do click the other, feel free to type something into the uh, question box just to let us know what that other is. But the, the choices we've listed there, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, muscular dystrophy, and acquired brain injury. A few suggestions in the other category, the oncology population, the autism population, developmental disabilities listed, craniopharyngioma, uh, a couple more for autism, so lots in the other, but we'll close the poll off and uh, share the results here. Uh, of the ones that were listed, 30% in that other category, um, another person in the other saying autism for sure, as well as other developmental disabilities, uh, cerebral palsy representing 24%, spina bifida only 5%, Muscular dystrophy, 30, 33%, and acquired injury, acquired brain injury at 10%. Mm. Okay, that's that's great. That's interesting. And autism, absolutely. We go, um, we we decided to focus on physical disabilities, but we are absolutely aware, and we've talked to our autism uh, clinician colleagues here about this, and we know it is a significant issue, especially with much of the medication that they um, they that now are using with kids uh, who have autism. So. That's, um, that's really interesting for, for us, and especially around the oncology. I actually had a conversation yesterday just with uh, someone around the um, sort of oncology kids. So uh, in, very interesting that, to hear about your experiences out there. So before I hand over to, Jude, uh, to uh, Julia, um, I just we were, just wanted to make an instinct, a distinction that today we are talking. We recognise that there is obesity prevention. So actually preventing it happening in the first place, and that may be educational, in schools, healthy eating, active living. Um, there is the treatment, so actually looking at obesity as a health condition, and there are various, as we know, not particularly successful interventions around that. And then the management about trying to kind of just prevent further weight gain. We often do that with our kids, trying to keep their weight stable, so if their height increases, they come into uh, their, their sort of... Um, that they manage their weight rather than put on, on more weight. There is such little research in kids with disabilities that we've had to kind of address. Um, we, we talk about all of them uh, without necessarily making a distinction, but we wanted just to kind of acknowledge that we, we realize that there is a, a, an important distinction between them, but sadly we don't have the, the uh, evidence to talk about them all separately. Um, and we we'll, would welcome anyone's comments um, on that. So I've spoken enough. I'm going to um, now hand over to Julia. And the next piece is really kind of looking at um, the different areas of challenges we identified in our summary, so assessment, communication, and intervention. So I'll uh, hand over to Julia now for the assessment piece. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so moving a lot right along, as Amy said, we're going to talk about the three different areas. But first of all, we'll talk about um, the challenges that we often face with assessment and classification of weight in children, particularly with disabilities, um, and we know um, we know it's even a, a greater challenge in kids with disabilities specifically. So we've got another poll coming up. So what do you feel the gold standard is uh, in assessing body fat in children with physical disabilities? And once again, we, we didn't actually list another here, but if you do have something oh, else, you'd like, if, if you'd like to add something else, then uh, by all means, uh, put, put type something else into the question box if you have something that you don't see on the screen here. Close this off and share the results. It looks like uh, the majority at 47% say BMI is the gold standard, uh, followed by height to waist ratio. 
uh, followed then by bioelectric impedance analysis at 16%, skin fold thickness at 11%, and 0% uh, percent saying waist circumference. Okay. Oh, oh. So then to follow that up, if that's our gold standard, how many of us uh, actually are able to practice our gold standard? So what do you or the clinicians in your in institution use most frequently? We know in an ideal world we all be doing the gold standard all the time, but it's not always the, the most realistic. <laughs> all right, so same choices again. Uh, but just which, what do you uh, use most frequently? As, as Julia said, no, we don't, have, don't always have the option to use the gold standard, so what do you use most frequently? And again, if there is something else uh, that's not listed on, the, on our list here, please feel free to type it into the question box. And it looks like uh, the most frequently used is BMI, uh, 10%, followed by skin fold thickness at 10%, uh, and only 5% saying height to waist ratio, no one using bioelectrical impedance or waist circumference, but 85% saying BMI. Okay, great. Um, so going further along, our challenges with assessment and classification of weight with children, um, particularly with disabilities, we know that there's often uh, an excess of adipose tissue. Uh, and we know that these kids don't always fit nicely into norms. So um, it, it's tough for us. And then going back to the previous two polls that we, we took, we really know that there is really no gold standard for assessing uh, fat in children with physical disabilities. Sorry about that. So yeah, my, the, the polls were kind of a trick question. We really know that there is no gold standard in assessing uh, fat in children with physical disabilities. We know that um, uh, for, you know, to accurately assess the adiposity, we know that we, there's a really, uh, it's, the demand on specialized equipment is high. We know that there needs to be high level of skill for the, the individual who is measuring the adipose tissue. Often the procedure to measure ac accurately can be quite invasive and there's a lot of demand on uh, the child as well as potentially the family because if the location of the specialized equipment is not necessarily available in every you know, clinical setting. And then finally there's uh, a question about the accuracy of health outcomes. So okay, yeah, we measure the level of fat in a child with a physical disability but we don't really fully understand at this point what the implications of, our, of this is. We know, as Amy already alluded to, that there is a difference in metabolic rate, and we know that the disposition of fat is different, so we're not really sure. It's, it's a really good question. And that leads us to, you know, so why is growth monitoring so important? Um, if, you know, we're not particularly accurate and there's no gold standard, why would we bother? Well, at the end of the day, the rationale pretty much the same as for typically developing children. But as Amy already alluded to in her, her slide in the impact of obesity on children with disabilities, we know that the negative outcomes can be more detrimental for children with disabilities uh, in particular. So our goal uh, for monitoring is really to um, assist health professionals to either confirm a child's healthy growth and development or to identify the potential nutritional or health concerns early on so an action plan can be developed before the child's nutritional status or health is, um, is seriously compromised. So in assessing uh, weight and height, some of the typical methods that are used are a standing scale, a chair scale, standing height, recumbent height, and even segmental height. And you know that's all well and good, but if it goes back to children with physical disabilities, that's often tough for some of our kids. So as a proxy method, we do use things such as arm stands, upper arm length, tibial length, knee height, and uh, using the ulna, the, the length of the ulna to estimate height. Um, and just keep these in the back of your mind as we go through some of our, our more data, data later on. And then finally, going back to assessing the body fat, we know that uh, skin fold thickness can provide additional information in the assessment of the nutritional status. It can be a direct uh, measure of energy reserves and an indirect measure of muscle stores, as well as uh, standard techniques are actually validated and can be used to measure skin fold measurements. 
And then finally, going back to I know uh, a lot of people are using waist circumference as well. We know that it captures the amount of fat located centrally in the body, which um, can definitely be de detrimental to the cardiometabolic health of everyone, not only children. Um, and we know that BMI doesn't really distinguish between, distinguish between fat and non-fat weight or indicate where the fat is, is located. My only sort of sort of take-home thought is to take, although these are validated and are really, really useful tools, just to take them with a little bit of grain of thought is that, you know, children with disabilities can carry their adipose tissue differently and in different places than typically developing kids. Um, and, you know, additionally, other physical abnormalities, and I use the example in the spina bifida population, if you have a child with a severe scoliosis and you were to take um, their waist circumference, it can, you know, on paper plot out so that they would be, you know, very, very obese, yet it may actually be a child who is wasted uh, in reality. So just to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And I'm going to pass along back to Amy now. So I, we've kind of been grappling with these, um, these issues for the last few years here. Uh, and that's what brought uh, myself as a researcher together with clinicians like Julia to really figure out, like, what do we do in practice? So we can look at it in research, kind of, yes, they've shown in, in research studies that waist circumference can be accurate, but really what's, what's manageable in day-to-day in -day kind of clinical practice. And so one of our first studies we looked at was just about, so we know kids with spina bifida have got all these high-risk factors, but like, what's going on? We've got, our clinicians are saying, yes, they're, they're all very overweight, we're really struggling with this, and so, we just started off by doing um, a medical record review um, just to see if even height and weight were being recorded. So simple, what a lot of people are doing anyway, a lot of people that would have been doing it who indicated they were doing BMI would obviously also ha would have to do height and weight to, to calculate that. So we did a medical record review here in our hospital just to figure out what was going on here before we looked out. Um, and this is sort of just a, a flow diagram of the different records, but I think the really important things to look at out of 180 patient charts, um, only 63 records had a valid height and weight that we could use to calculate BMI. So something's happening in our, you can see at the bottom there, in our um, kind of clinical practice here. Um, and then from those, I've just blown that up a little bit because it's a bit small. Um, so about 24% were overweight, 17-18% um, could be classified as obese, and about just under 10% were the underweight. So we can see that there's a substantial issue with, um, with overweight and obese. Um, but the interesting thing was we also looked in the charts about, okay, so are people doing, what else are people doing? Any other calculations? Uh, any, what, are they recording discussions that they're having with these kids? If we think back to our kind of prevention and management slide, you know, is anyone even talking about this? Because you can measure weight and height, but if you don't communicate it, then um, there's a bit of a disconnect um, there. And we will be talking, obviously, about discussions. So in our medical record review, it just showed about 27% of children who had been classified as overweight or obese um, actually had anything in their notes discussing, uh, like sort of noting that they, they had discussed weight or weight management. So there's a clinical kind of disconnect going on um, here. But so we thought, well, maybe it's just here. And we obviously discussed with the team. And the team were the ones who wanted to do the research in the first place, knowing that they had there was kind of uh, an issue. So when we looked outside of our own clinic, we did an environmental scan of all spina bifida clinics across Canada. Um, and you can see most people are assessing weight. Um, most people are saying they're assessing height, which is kind of interesting given that in our, our medical record review, you know, we, about just under 50% didn't even have a weight recorded in the past year and a half. So, you know, that's interesting, but yeah, that's, I mean, it's all self-report, which we have to bear in mind for methodological reasons. But people are saying their weight and height are being, um, taken and recorded, and they used a, rare, a variety of different assessment approaches for this. There was some limitation, there was some awareness, sorry, of the limitations of some of these. So we'll get more into BMI in a minute, um, but um, often people say there was a lack of time, a lack of equipment, a lack of, lack of expertise to even do weights and heights in the kids coming to the spina bifida clinics. 
And then there was a whole other issue around, do they even discuss it with people? So only 20% of the respondents said, yes, we discuss the results of whatever height and weight we do with our uh, children um, with, their, with their parents. And 46% of them most of the time. Now, the very low um, numbers are whether they were referred to specialist weight management programs. And we know this is a substantial lack uh, in services um, and research. And we will go into that uh, in a bit more detail. But we can see really that there are very, people are struggling with referral options for children with physical disabilities, in this case, spina bifida, but I don't think it's different across any other disabilities, of those sort of referral options. What do you do once you actually identify there's an issue? Uh, and this is something we're really interested in and don't have the answers to, um, but I'm, I'd you know, be interested if people want to say what their experiences are um, about trying to refer on. So this is the interesting piece for us. We went on to do, because uh, there are a few, there are some prevalences of, of kids with disabilities, their obesity and overweight in the literature, but certainly for conditions such as spina bifida, a lot of them were done over 15 years ago. Um, they were maybe done retrospectively, um, you know, they weren't using optimal methodology. Uh, and given that we know the prevalence of overweight and obesity in typically developing kids has in, increased in the last few years, you know, it wouldn't, it's not a giant leap to, to wonder whether this has also happened um, since those original prevalence studies. So we did a prospective study. Um, we measured a, a huge amount of things around um, anthropometrics and lifestyle behaviors. But I'm just going to talk about height and weight. Um, and look at how we're classifying our kids. So from uh, we had 72 kids that took part. And the interesting thing was they were all really keen to take part. I, to this day, I'm not sure exactly why we saw this. Um, but people, the youth and the parents were really, really keen to take part in this study. And they were weighed and measured in a number of different ways, including skin fold thickness, waist circumference, um, height and weights, and different ways of proxies for height. Um, and from this, we can see about 44% of our kids were overweight or obese. And that's using the World Health Organization growth charts for Canada. And there's now a 20, uh, 2014 version online. Um, and um, that website is available. So that was really interesting. Um, out of, most of them had myelomeningocele. Most of them were ambulatory. Um, and we had very high interrate of reliability. We made sure that we were getting it absolutely accurate. Um, with two or more um, observers to make sure. So you can see 44%, that's substantially higher than the 26 to 30% in typically developing kids. Uh, and gives us a better picture because our medical record review, that was only kids who had had a height and weight measured. And it could be that the reason they had it measured was because it was a suspicion of it being overweight. So this gave us a much more unbiased sample. And we took everybody. So what's really interesting, though, is that we use the different forms of height to calculate the BMI of the child. So if possible, we like to get height either standing or recumbent or even segmental methods if the child has severe contractures. So using the different um, sort of from toe to head, measuring each, each section. Um, arm span has been suggested as a proxy for height, as well as ulnar length. Um, and there are, there are um, uh, equations that you can use for this to calculate BMI. Now, if you look at using standard and recumbent height, as I said in the previous slide, 44% of our kids were overweight or obese. Now, that drops to 40% if you use an arm span to calculate the BMI, and then drops to 25% if you use an ulna length. So it really matters what type of measures you take and calculate this. And this is why it's so challenging for us um, to, to calculate kind of, um, uh, even a proxy of body mass or fat mass such as um, BMI. So it, we could be having um, you know, grossly underestimating or, or overestimating. We just don't know at the moment. So I think that, that needs a substantial more research in it um, to figure out what's going on with those calculations. And of course, those are using you know, sort of standardized calculations. 
Okay. Um, so just in mind, we see with waste circumference that you know we had a, a, a vast proportion, um, or lots of thirty percent who had greater waste circumference. Uh, and also excess body fat. So we know something's going on. We know they're at risk population. We know that there are higher rates, and now we have to look into it a bit more. So just um, just to take the take-home messages from this sort of section around assessment is that we have no gold standard. We need to be really careful of using growth charts that are developed with a typically developing population. And our, our main message about tracking over time is the critical piece. So not one-off and classify them on that one-off um, one-off measurement, but to track over time, look for trends and patterns, compare the child with themselves previously rather than with other children uh, and with norms. Um, and really, there is a, a real need to develop some condition-specific growth charts in order to kind of provide uh, more optimal clinical care around kind of um, weight and dyslexia and diet and so on. So I did mention that. Um, you can measure all you like, um, but if you don't communicate it, then that can be, you know, a, 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 an issue. So this is, I think, our, I think our last poll, um, and we would just like to know. So, how confident do you feel about talking about weight with your clients and families? Over to you, Doug. Poll for the day: um, Your chance to tell us how comfortable you feel discussing weight-related topics with clients and families. Uh, just from very uncomfortable up to very comfortable. And one of the things I just I want to just take this chance to remind the audience, if you do have any questions, please uh, do type them in, and uh, uh, we will be getting to them in a few minutes. If you do have any questions, or if you'd like to make a comment, I forgot to mention the top of the, uh, of the webinar that uh, we are using the hashtag CAFC Presents. If anyone has a comment or a question they would like to put on Twitter, we are sort of following that now. Um, but uh, you're also welcome to just use the internal question box here if you do have any comments or questions. So we'll just close this poll off, uh, and we'll see that uh, it's a quite a quite a range. 17% uh, saying they're very comfortable, 48% saying they're somewhat comfortable, 13% saying somewhat uncomfortable, and 22% saying very uncomfortable. That's yeah, that's really interesting and not not surprising at all from. Our um, work and that of others. Let's try and get us back on track. So we know with kids with typically developing, or clinicians who are dealing with typically developing kids, we hear a lot of that, a lot of um, underconfidence because of they don't feel people, they don't feel they've had the right training, uh, they don't necessarily have the right the time to go into something in depth and don't want to do kind of like a, just a quick five minutes. Um, so a real lack of confidence. And a real fear of jeopardizing relationships with families. Um, and again, of kind of we're, we're so aware these days around mental health issues and eating disorders um, that I know a lot of clinicians have a, a you know a real concern about whether discussing weight um, and diet is going to trigger an eating disorder in a client. Um, and so, but so that's with typically developing kids, and I think we can all um, recognize a lot of what that was talking about as well. But what about kids with disabilities? So, I mean, as healthcare professionals, um, we see the kids uh, or the youth all, all the time, or much more often, often if they're coming in for repeat um, sort of checkups and uh, therapy and so on. So, really, clinicians working in rehab is, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity to discuss health behaviors such as physical activity and diet uh, and, and weight management. Um, and people have argued that you know youth with disabilities need the same counselling and guidance about health-related behaviours as, as typically developing kids. So at the end of the day, they're still kids, um, and we do have some kind of you know willingness with youth, some evidence say you know they don't actually mind discussing weight and healthy eating and physical activity. But the issue is there's no specific guidance. There's no guidance for typically developing kids, and there certainly isn't any guidance about how we talk about weight with um, kids with disabilities. And it's not a giant leap to think that there may be some um, additional issues with kids who are dealing with complex um, conditions um, that, that, may, that may be um, problematic on top of what we already know. And so just to give a quick, just a, a, just a snapshot of some research we've done here where we interviewed clinicians, uh, youth and children and parents just to find out how do you talk about weight when you come into clinics? 
what, what words do you use, what do you do, why do you do that, how, what approach do you take, and so on. And we really, from our clinicians, we really got that, picked up that fear around that do no harm. So it's very loaded, we're nervous, it's a tightrope, um, we're really worried about kids' self-esteem and damaging that. Um, and everyone sort of, you know, everyone waits for the parent, people wait for the parents to bring it up. Um, and, and that sort of saying about the lack of training, we, we're not trained. And so some parallels, but then some extra um, issues as well. Now from parents, they felt very guilty and blamed um, around their child's weight, um, felt it was a comment on their parenting, their experiences um, there. And, and then a, a lack of, or a mismatch between um, you know, that weight and numbers then a kind of a more health promotion approach that our kids and parents um, both kind of called for. Uh, and then the interesting thing I think about rehab is that often when people come in, they see multiple healthcare professionals. Um, so there is a risk of every, either everyone talking about it or no one talking about it. And then often we heard that clinicians try to link the weight issue with function. So you know, if you just lost some weight, you'd be able to walk for the rest of your life. That was actually one of our quotes. Uh, and, and that can often be off-putting, as we can see with our kids here saying, you know, yeah, yeah, I have to lose weight to keep walking, yeah, yeah, you know, and it just wasn't going in after that. So although clinicians may feel that was a good way to hook kids in, it didn't necessarily work. And then we have some kind of um, different approaches and that idea of like uh, time in clinic. Often, our, you know, the kids come in and time is really precious. Uh, and pressured on, we've got to look at bowel and bladder, we've got to look at school, we've got to look at range of motion, pain, uh, and often kind of diet and activity are, don't feature into in hard pressed kind of clinical situations. So we can see we've got very common concerns, training time, confidence, jeopardizing relationships, um, and then we have the kind of, there are multiple priorities going on. Um, some kids we say, you know, well, of course I'm overweight. I've got a, I've got spina bifida. Um, when you've got multiple healthcare professionals, there's an issue around role clarity. Again, I mentioned earlier about families are dealing with a huge amount, uh, may not be able to take this on as well, or fear of that from clinicians. So um, just to sort of really flag that, you know, these are um, these are serious uh, or, or differences we have to think about when we're working with kids with physical disabilities. And we have tried to encapsulate that into um, some simulation um, training videos for healthcare professionals who are qualified. So often our simulations are for trainees. Uh, we've done these for qualified healthcare professionals, um, show different situations about kind of, uh, we've built them around um, the four uh, child and family centered care tenants that we use at Holland Bloorview. So respect and dignity, collaboration, so you know, involving parents, using their expertise, that partnership, helping parents come up with solutions themselves, and how we can um, effectively share information. I think in the interest of time, we may just move on rather than try to show the video, but if anyone's interested, uh, we, we have four different ones, they are very welcome to uh, contact me and we can, um, we can figure that out. So they're just literally hot off the press. We finished them uh, two weeks ago, and we will be evaluating them to see, can we increase people's confidence and also their competence? So the two have to come together. So I think our take home messages from this portion around communication, what we're hearing from kids and, and families is that they really want a strength-based approach. So one of our kids says, you know, stop telling me what I can't do, focus on what I can do. And they're getting, you know, like, they spend a lot of time being told what they, they can't do appropriately or properly. Um, so taking the strength-based approach, what's their ability, what's their interest, and how can we kind of foster that and use that for a sort of a, a positive outcomes. And this is kind of around the solution-focused coaching we're looking at about how we can use that to try and, and play to the child's strengths and the family strengths for, for um, positive outcomes, and outcomes that they themselves have identified that are meaningful for them. Um, very much around acknowledging challenges. Weight management is challenging for very many of us. 
as well as a lot of children, and then especially as children with physical disabilities. And there has to be much more sort of, I think, acknowledgement of the challenges rather than the kind of, haven't you, showed, haven't you followed the advice I've given you? You know, what's going on? Why aren't you doing it? So making assumptions um, and acknowledging the challenges involved. There's good team coordination, uh, communication, that's a, a given, but something we need to attend to when we know we have these large, often I have these large teams where things can either fall through the net or everyone's talking about them, and in both cases, it's not optimal. Identifying, identifying the priorities of, of everyone at that um, consultation or at that clinic visit, everyone comes in with their own agendas, their own priorities, and kind of trying to figure out how they all fit together. Um, so, and then empowering children and families to indicate their preferences. Like, I don't want to talk about this with you. I would prefer to talk about it with X person or whatever, but that takes some active sort of fostering and, and facilitating. But often we, we see our kids for over a long period of time, we have the opportunity to develop relationships. That's why they're so, we're so worried about damaging them by talking about uh, weight. But we need to work more with our children and families to really express what their preferences are. Otherwise, everyone sits around waiting for everyone else to bring it up, uh, and then we don't get, um, we don't get anywhere. So um, does anyone have any uh, comments, questions, uh, anything they want to say? I mean, I, I think it's a, an issue close to a lot of people's hearts in clinical practice. So if anyone had anything they would like to contribute to that, talking about weight, that's, uh, I'd be really interested. We would be really interested to, to hear your uh, ideas and thoughts. So we'll carry on, but please do feel free to make any comments or questions. So what do we do about all of this? Um, one, of, one of the issues that sometimes we hear puts off clinicians to identifying a weight issue and addressing it and talking about it is that they can't do anything about it. And certainly with the families that we speak to, um, there is that frustration when a clinician has raised it as a problem um, and then can't offer any solutions or anything that they can do and it can lead to real kind of helplessness. Um, especially when clinicians have raised it as a sort of have really problematized it. Um, so it's, it's gone beyond, hey, this is your BMI and these are things, some things you want to think about to this is a big issue and it's a, sort of a medical um, problem, but then can't follow, can't follow up. And the reason is we actually don't have too much to offer at the moment. This is our frustration. Uh, we don't have too much evidence base, I should say. So there are guidelines out there. So very recently, actually, just a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, um, there was a position paper that came out uh, for individuals with all disabilities. But when you read it, um, although yeah, kids with spina bifida are in there, kids with um, DMD are in there, um, actually a lot of it really focuses on the intellectual disability um, population which are a very vulnerable population as well, but it doesn't, get, it doesn't help us much with um, the kind of best practices around um, working with nutrition, dietetics with physical disabilities. There have been guidelines around um, adapting or making um, physical activity, nutrition, and obesity programs more inclusive of kids with physical disabilities, of people with physical disabilities. But again, kids don't actually feature that highly in it. And we know that the sort of physical activities they're going to be taking part in um, are maybe very different to the sort of context and types and, and characteristics of the physical activity that um, adults take part in. And then I don't know how many people are, are linked in to uh, the Canadian Obesity Network. They have a great resource with the five A's of obesity management. They now have, they have started with one for adults. They now have one for children and for women who are pregnant. Uh, and they're bringing out kind of different um, tweaked versions for different people. Again, kids with disabilities aren't really featured in there at all beyond have an accessible um, scale to where your kid's on because, you know, some of our kids we do have that issue with. Um, so can offer some useful guidance, but it's not specific to disability. So these are the kind of issues that we're dealing with that the guidance just isn't out there. So in terms of like, okay, so what does the research say? Has a research looked at it? And actually we see that children with disabilities are actually excluded routinely from health promotion, obesity prevention, physical activity type 
um, studies. Um, and there was a, a widely cited systematic review, very rigorously done uh, a few years ago through the Cochrane Collaboration, so a high quality systematic review. Um, and they, had, they included 55 studies in it. And we actually checked, traced down 54 of them. That last one eluded us. Um, but from 54 of their 55 studies, less than 10% of those studies actually provided an inclusion or exclusion criteria that a child with an illness or disability or chronic condition could potentially have met. So less than 10%. And nearly a quarter of them explicitly excluded children who had any form of kind of condition, illness, impairment. So kids with disabilities have been routinely excluded from this kind of research. Uh, and in fact, the rest of the studies actually didn't include, um, they didn't provide inclusion exclusion criteria because they were kind of done at school level. Um, so we, we just don't, we're not, their kids aren't even making it into the research studies to be able to provide evidence-based guidance. And so just to kind of, um, so just to flash out, we tried to do, we tried to replicate um, their systematic review for um, kids with disabilities. And we got, we just found that the information wasn't there, the data isn't there, and the evidence isn't there. So we did a scoping review, which is somewhat broader and includes all forms of, um, of evidence, um, no matter the quality kind of, uh, the traditional quality assessment criteria is not, is, is used differently. Um, and we see most of them around physical fitness, a little around nutritional status, um, very little around kind of the healthy weight, health promotion, healthy lifestyles that we personally try to advocate here. Um, and the only, we looked at any study that was actually had a positive outcome. They, re, they reported a you know, significant change. All were around physical activity. And there are some kind of indications there. So the child should be self-directing it. So they're choosing their own. Um, their, their own goals, um, motivational strategies. So they might have motivational text messages, or um, they might have a coach who keeps them motivated. Uh, and that the child is the target of the intervention. So they, may, they, they are the one that the intervention is given to, but they may not have come up with their own goals. So I mean, we have some kind of glimpses of what may be helpful. Um, but we certainly wouldn't go as far as to say that there is an at the moment, a uh, robust evidence base for this. So yeah, what to do? We're going to look at our take home messages and then some kind of indications for what we call, we're going to call best practices for now, but we don't practice, we don't pretend they are um, robustly supported by evidence. But Julie's going to run through them kind of where we think the positive approaches are and that we think should uh, be sort of moving forward where we should putting up our energies. But again, going through them, we'd love other people's um, opinions and thoughts on this. So back to Julia to, to finish off. Great. Thanks, Amy. So, you know, we've spoken, as Amy said, a lot about the challenges, a lot about the research gaps. But there are, in fact, some promising approaches that we know or we, we have a very strong suspicion uh, or anecdotally we know that are, are working for, ch um, that do work for when you're working with children with disabilities and their families. So first off, we know that when you focus on what the child can do and you tailor your recommend recommendations on that, um, while including the child and the family and their interests in the recommendations, that that's when the most success is achieved. And I mean, I say, um, you know, it's recommendations, 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 but it really it should be not a prescriptive uh, approach. It really should be working with families um, that can focus on what they can do and, you know, what what they really want to do. Um, we know that kids do better when they're included. So, if as health professionals, or as you know, teachers, as people in the community, if we can advocate for the activities that they're doing to be inclusive and allow them to be just regular kids and be with their peers, then, you know, off on their own doing something separate, it, it's more fun that way. Um, our, our kids that are more successful are the ones that are, you know, playing basketball with their classmates rather than told that they have to do laps around the gym because, you know, how could they ever play basketball with the rest of the kids in their class? But, you know, a really creative, um, a really creative partnership with, you know, School, uh, school programs can, can really foster that and really help kids be successful. 
firstly, I'm just going to jump in, Julia, just with, uh, it's about maybe not making assumptions. So making things that are inclusive if children with disabilities want to take part. So some may really, really want to take part with their, all their peers, and some may feel a more safe environment with other kids with disabilities. However, that's, that's the point, that there are options. Mm -hmm. so. And, you know, asking them what they want, and it may be a, a matter of easing into it. Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately having, you know, whatever you recommend and whatever you come up with as a plan with the, the child and the family, make sure that it's, it's realistic and realistic for the long term so that the child and their family can actually change their behaviors permanently. You know, coming up with the idea of going to a fully accessible um, center is a really good idea, but if you know, the family lives an hour and a half away, and it's not really realistic for the long term, particularly, you know, when January and February rolls around the calendar. Um, and kind of what Amy talked to a little, uh, a little bit earlier, but, you know, acknowledge the, cha the challenges that families are facing. They've told us that, um, as health professionals, you know, acknowledge the struggles that we're facing, but by the same token, I would say also celebrate the successes. You know. Even a you know even the child that comes in that they haven't lost weight but if they haven't gained it acknowledge that and celebrate it and make sure um, you know make sure that the families and the, the child are, the child is not feeling like a failure on, on a regular basis um, and be re realistic discuss with families the difference between the child's best weight and their ideal weight and there's a really great quote there from Friedhoff and Sharma that says a patient's best weight is whatever weight they achieve while living the healthiest lifestyle they can truly enjoy. Because at the end of the day, and it's the same for everybody, not just kids with uh, disabilities, is if you're told that you have to eat celery sticks for three meals a day, I don't think I personally would be happy about that, and I don't think I'd really be enjoying that lifestyle and wouldn't be motivated to do so. And back to Amy. So this is just the, the, the last piece I wanted to, I wanted to do, take the opportunity to do some marketing. Um, so, as you can see, we, we've, we've conducted quite a lot of research around sort of the health promotion topics in kids with uh, physical disabilities. Um, we've tried to connect across the world. We have connections in, in the UK, in the States. Um, when we were doing the review of articles for the interventions, we were struck how kind of piecemeal it was across Canada. And there were only, there were very few studies that had, had been conducted in Canada. So we have um, created a network, so DocsNet, Disability and Obesity in Canadian Children Network, um, to really build capacity within clinicians, to bring the clinicians and researchers who are doing this kind of research or clinical practice together to learn from each other so that we can, when we ha see um, literature or anything, we can disseminate that out to people. And then people can bring the expertise to us. Uh, as well for, and I'm envisaging like future collaborations on research grants, um, having great knowledge users uh, who are going to uh, be the end users of the research, um, to come together to identify uh, the priority, what are the priority questions we should be asking? And of course our key partners in that are families and children. Um, and we regularly consult with them around what's meaningful to them, what's a meaningful question to them, what makes sense, what, you know, if we, are we completely going up the wrong, um, wrong path? Um, so it's going to be really critical to have those multiple stakeholders involved in the network. So at the moment, it's virtual. Uh, there is a website. Uh, if you would like your details uh, to be added to our database, you can just email me. There's in instructions on the website. So I just wanted to get, take a chance to say, you know, we, there, is a, there is a growing community across Canada who are working on this, but it's, it's small but mighty at the moment. Um, but we'd love to harness that. And it may be like talking about research priorities, it may be about kind of leveraging the different, like many different centers um, to make sure we have the real impact, then sort of the, the numbers, the buy-in, uh, the expertise all brought together so that we can re really use our resources most um, efficiently and effectively. So that's my plug for that. And then other than that, we'd like to thank um, all the people that we um, conduct the research with that we uh, have talked about today um, and our funding sources. Um, and we would uh, love thoughts, um, suggestions, things you disagree with. Um, any, any comments are welcome. 
All right. Thank you very much. And while we're waiting for anyone uh, to type in any questions or comments based on all the great stuff we've just heard, uh, I'll, I'll maybe uh, ask uh, Dr. Andrew if uh, if you have any comments or any any any, any thoughts to share uh, based on the presentation. Oh, thanks, Doug. And Amy, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, it aligns so perfectly with one of our goals through SINCE, through the Canadian Network of Child Youth Rehabilitation, and that's to improve the outcome of, of children and families with disabilities based on uh, research evidence. But I think most important is this get, translating this research and the information into practice. And the the practice not just for clinicians but involving families and translating this information to families so that we can empower families to raise the questions with their clinicians. I'm really excited about looking at the, like the tools because I think that's what a lot of uh, both primary health care providers as well as uh, clinicians such as myself who work within a rehabilitation setting. If we had the tools, if we felt more comfortable, and if we can gain that kind of skill with your the training videos, uh, I think to have, have them more widely, just get them out there so that we, they can be used. So I think this research that you've been doing gives us a, a lot uh, of, of things that we can actually put into practice. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, we're really excited about our simulations. Um, they were developed with parents and, and many of the words spoken in those simulations are actually from our interviews from par with parents. So um, that was a piece we're very, um, we're very excited about. And although uh, we were funded by the Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus Association of Canada, so they are Spina Bifida focused, but I, I think there's so many of the facets that are really um, generalizable to other populations other difficult conversations as well. So how do you approach difficult conversations generally? And then around weight, physical activity, how do you approach that in different kind of populations? So um, yeah, we're very excited, but we want to evaluate them before we let them loose in the world because again, it's this evidence-based, right? So um, we would be very open to any partners that wanted to join with us um, to help evaluate them and making sure we're putting out the best possible evidence and we translate it in the sort of with the with the biggest reach to our clinicians and families. And maybe some of the members of our sensor or organization because we do have quite broad representation of some of the major rehabilitation centers uh, across Canada. We could engage in in that type of partnership. Uh, we would love that. We'd be very much welcome that. Thank you for that. And anyone who's interested in connecting uh, with Dr. McPherson on this, uh, just either if you have her contact information directly, I'm sure she wouldn't mind being contacted. But if you don't have it, just feel free to contact us at CAFC here, and we can certainly put you in touch. That would be great. Thanks, Doug. So we don't have any comments from the audience. They're a little quiet today for some reason. Um, Don't them into silence. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll give everyone just another uh, few seconds to type something in, and uh, and maybe we'll uh, we'll uh, wrap it up a little bit early today if we don't have any questions. And uh, maybe asking our audience members with within the subject of obesity and within the disability population, are there other aspects of this discussion that <laughs> organize future webinars to highlight different different parts of this, although I think Amy and Julie have done such a, a really good summary of the basic data right up to this. I think we're just on the cliff of this exciting research. Mm -hmm. Doug, Doug, it's Elaine. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, first of all, um, thank you so much, uh, Julie and Amy, for a fantastic presentation, as Gail has said. I'm just wondering the tools. Um, that um, that have been in part the results of your research, and, and these are so important. I may have missed this, and apologies if I did. Are any of the tools being designed, or will they be evaluated, tools specifically for parents or families? I'm going to say families and children. Are you referring to kind of guidelines? or what sort of tools were you um, thinking? Okay, the guidelines, yes, but but where you're giving where you're giving these to families to sort of take the lead on. 
as opposed to counsel, if, if I'm making any sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, our, our, our first point is kind of toward, more towards kind of clinical practice guidelines, you know, creating or developing uh, or collating as much evidence as we can to provide clinical practice guidelines, but it would be absolutely critical to involve parents in that. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, parent-driven or parent-led um, sort of guidance or um, sort of question checklists or, or whatever those tools might look like is, is a really nice next step, I think, um, let's say involving the different stakeholders. So I like that idea. I think we're sort of starting starting at the clinical practice level with family input and then moving more to family-driven tools. I don't know if you want to add. Unless you have some that you'd like to share with us. Yes. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I'm checking my back pocket. No, I don't. But I, <laughs> Sorry, I just, you I just feel, them. though, that you know, you've made such all of your points. But in particular, you know, not making assumptions and allowing options. You know, w there we were talking about you know, some of the physical activities that children may or may not want to participate in. But taking that concept a little broadly and uh, a little bit more broadly, I, I think the, the leadership of families in, in this, as opposed to being counseled, as I said before, mm -hmm. um, fits, fits into, that, into that concept of not assuming you know, and, and um, not assuming that the parent necessarily wants and in some cases maybe needs the only the, 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 the guidelines or the guidance from clinicians. Mm. Other can take that leadership role, you know, it's so family leadership as opposed to um, that the, the sort of the provider to family. It, it just, it's just something that strikes me, especially when it comes to uh, a topic like obesity. Yeah, and I know in the research that we have conducted, that definitely is part of the themes, some of the themes that have come up. Mm -hmm. And certainly in our simulation videos, although they're starting uh, at the clinician side, much of what we're, you know, one of the whole themes really is partnership with families. Um, and yeah. making sure that you're, um, it, as, I, as I said, it's not really pr providing a prescriptive program for families, but it really is working with them to find out what motivates them, what works for them, what will fit in their life mm -hmm. uh, to have the most success. And a lot of that is really listening to families and, and having them tell you uh, what is going to work and then having the health professional really sort of just facilitate um, what might set the, the client up for success. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Another project with CAFC is the tremendous amount of work that's going on right now with the Committee of Practice on Transitions. And we should also focus on those youth who become young adults who are then going to be independently making some of their own decisions about lifestyle that we need to target the young adults who have chronic health conditions as well. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point, Gail. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's something that we are looking at in other facets. We're actually looking at that in terms of adolescent um, health promotion programs. So you're right that they're tailored for adolescent priorities, and um, but it's giving them the tools so they can use that uh, as they become more important. So, uh, yes, I completely agree with you. We'd love to link to you on that. I just yeah, one more comment. I, mean, I think this comes back to the, you know, the level of comfort or not, you know, in terms of dealing dealing with the topic. It's it's just a whole other philosophy. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And even in language, I mean, I there is you know a, a strong push for person first language, which I completely agree with. But it's it you have to really you have to be mindful and aware the whole time. It's a person with you know obesity, not an obese. Person, you know, we 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 know the the rhetoric, but it's again just being really mindful of our language when we're speaking not only to children and families, but also other colleagues and in, in our writing and so on. So something exactly. that uh, we have to be just kind of on top of the whole time, I think. And I think specifically with such a and it, again, it came out in our research such a touchy uh, and stigmatizing subject as well. Yeah. 
We did have a comment from Tessia who says she thinks it is essential for clinicians working with families to put aside their own agenda regarding uh, health promotion and weight management and to take the time to find out from families what is important to them and what they are interested in doing or not doing. Yeah, oh. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're nodding vigorously at this end. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great conversation. Uh, thanks, uh, Gail and Elaine, for uh, for uh, spurring that uh, that interesting conversation. So uh, I, I don't see any more questions from uh, from the audience. So if there's any uh, closing comments that uh, Dr. McPherson and Julia would like to uh, to sort of wrap up with, uh, we'd love to hear just some closing comments from you. Um. No, I mean, we'd just like to thank you for the opportunity and, and that we would really welcome anybody contacting us, and especially around the kind of the network. And, you know, if you want to publish that out to your um, connections and networks of anyone that could come to this or come to the talk um, or anyone that you now talk to. Um, so that would be our sort of our plea is to we'd love, we really want to promote the collaboration and collaborative working. Um, power and number. Power and numbers, absolutely. So thanks so much for giving us a chance to talk about uh, this important topic. All right. And Gail, anything uh, anything to add before we sign off? Well, I just see some future opportunities that we can take to our sensor members. Wonderful. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McPherson and, and Julia. Fantastic presentation and, and great conversation here. I think the audience uh, really appreciated that. Uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's always great if you can watch live as you get the you get to participate in that conversation. As I mentioned at the begin, or I didn't mention at the beginning, I mentioned partway through. We are starting to add uh, Twitter uh, with the hashtag uh, CAPC Presents. If you wanted to participate in the con in the conversation that way, it really helps to enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch live, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on the Ken. Usually takes a couple of weeks to get, uh, or a couple of days uh, to get that information up. But the person's who, the person whose email address is registered, will get a, a notification when that information is available. And also like to say thanks again to Prolacta for helping support uh, uh, our episodes of uh, CAPC Presents as well for our uh, and support our knowledge translation activities. Uh, next week we uh, have some great uh, stuff coming up. We have a session titled Trauma-Informed Care, uh, which is about creating physically and emotionally safe environments for clients, families, and staff. And we'll be hearing from our colleagues at the IWK Health Center in Halifax about how trauma, by which they mean, and by trauma they mean anything that, re any anything that results from experiences that experiences that overwhelm an individual's capacity to cope and can result from childhood abuse, neglect, undergoing repeated medical interventions, uh, any kind of trauma in the broad sense, and they'll be sharing their program to adopt a system, systemic trauma-informed care approach and offering trauma-specific services that can help them better serve children and youth. Uh, and then following that, we'll be having part two of our series on patient safety. Uh, we'll, uh, that episode will be titled uh, Safety by Design, where, we'll, where we will be hearing from Wayne Ho from Human Factors uh, at University of Toronto, at the University Health Network, and Kim Streitenberger from ISMP Canada, where they will be talking about the ways that design and designing our uh, external environment, designing our documents, our equipment, our devices, how design can influence the safety of our patients in our institutions. So that's going to be a great session as well. Uh, so lots of great stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us again today, and we hope to see you back here next week. Bye. Everybody.